Maybe if you're of a certain age, think back to the summer of 1982. And if you're not, think about this. Many critics consider it the best summer for movies ever. Ronald Reagan was president, Ebony and Ivory was the number one song, and movie history was being made. They're here. Four of the double cheese and sausage. <laughs> right here, dude. <laughs> see what is happening on set right now to mark the 30th anniversary of the summer of 82 the alamo draft house cinema in austin texas will recreate it by showing all those blockbuster flicks on their original release dates i could watch the wrath of khan any day i thought you were going to say i could watch david i could watch david edelstein <laughs> any day uh, i'm reliving my lost youth i'm, great, I'm haunted such by it. great yeah. great stuff film critic for both cbs sunday morning and new york magazine david a pleasure to have you here. good morning i thank you for haunting me with my with all the possibilities i felt in 82 in this uh, great year why, why was 82 so great it was the last year i think that pretentious pointy-headed critics like me and the mass <laughs> audience agreed on everything i mean uh, well, almost everything, not Rocky Three, but uh, <laughs> but I mean I, I mean it was it was the last time where you had blockbusters that were personal, that were personal yeah. filmmaking, and they weren't sort of machine tooled, they weren't full of CGI, which makes miracles yeah. cheap. It mm -hmm. was a wonderful, exhilarating summer. Why can't Hollywood do that these days? It seems like it has to be the massive blockbuster, devoid of personality, or the indie film. Well, I mean, so you think it's split right around '82? Yeah, uh, pretty or after, much. Well, yeah, pretty that. much when the corporations and the marketing people marketing. got in, and uh, it's a little bit of a cliche, but the fact is, they will bring in eight write, eight screenwriters to punch up the scripts. The director will be, in, in a sense, enslaved by by the, the studio executives, who some of them are smart, most of them don't know what they're doing, and so what you get, movies are kind of the same now, yeah. and CGI really depersonalizes a lot of the effects. If you see E.T., if you see Poltergeist, if you see the thing these are really hand beautifully handcrafted effects in these movies you mentioned et steven yes. spielberg's et what a magnificent film well one of his masterpieces and again so personal about a lonely young boy who's searching for a sign of a benevolent universe that's going to bring people together in a way suburban life doesn't uh, just a, a gorgeous gorgeous film and again the great critic pauline kale said it cleared all the bad thoughts out of your head mm. It was a busy year for Spielberg. He storyboarded Poltergeist. Mm -hmm. Had his yeah. hands all over Poltergeist. He did, he did. And that put all the bad thoughts back into your head. Because <laughs> that was the other side of the suburb, you know, built on Native American graveyards and families ripped apart by these supernatural forces that sort of had, the, had these zones of horribleness inside their beautiful suburban houses. I, I mean, it was, it's still a terrifying film. And then there's Star, there's Star Trek too, which we talked about. It's this fantastic... Come it's, it's, I just it's want a, to be able to It's do a sci-fi thriller, but, it, but, it's, but it's about people, and, it, and it's a story, right? Yes. You know, after the sort of Logie reverential first Star Trek movie, which was a real bummer, they got Nicholas Meyer. He came in. He brought Ricardo Montalban with his giant pecs. You know, he, it was really, it was fun. You know, it, it also was full of awe. It was tragic. He, I think he single-handedly brought back the Star Trek franchise, back in the days when franchises we only used for Burger King. See, that's a problem with movies today. Yep. They use franchise. They, I mean, no one thought of movies as a franchise mm -hmm. back then. And but Shatner was so good. Oh, he was, he made fun of himself, which the guy never does. He's so pompous. But, you know, here was a movie where he was self-deprecating. He was modest. You know, he gave space to all the other actors. It was a beautiful thing. And it's never happened again. We have to get to Rocky Three because it was so contentious. And you pity the fool who thinks it's a good movie. <laughs> well, you always have to have in the summer a movie by a moron for morons. But it did give us, and it was the same thing repeated that he'd done. But it did give us Mr. T as Clubber Lang for better or worse, so. Both David and I were like, Rocky 3? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's the one blight.
But, but you still leave it on, I think, sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. In the background. Yeah. I'd rather watch Conan the Barbarian, mm. you know. Another great oh, one from that year. Yeah, which Clive, Clive James said, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger looked like a condom stuffed with walnuts. <laughs> and, wow. Uh, <laughs> you know. We don't normally end segments on a thought like that, but oh, David Edelstein. Thank you so much.